to move at the crossing of robotics and the wild card, remember, E else, with Bertrand Naum, Bertrand Naum, who is now the founder of Quantum Surgicals. You can give him some applause huh, if you want. Okay, Bertin, actually, you made quite a reputation for the last uh, business you sold two years ago, or a year ago, actually, MedTech. Uh, it was really disruptive in the way that you brought robotics directly in the surgery room. And what we're about to watch together right now is actually us being brought into the surgery room to see how robotics and surgeons are actually working together. Is that right? That's okay. Let's watch the video together. Three-year-old Bailey Bates is about to have her second brain surgery. This time, a lime-sized portion of her brain will be removed. It's scary to have to take out your child's brain and not know the aftermath. Bailey has focal epilepsy and has had seizures since she was about nine months old. On bad days, there'd be hundreds. She was seizing every two, three minutes. Um, so basically, she was a seizure. She was just losing everything that she had learned and just was like this in my arms all day, every day. After trying a long list of epilepsy drugs and one failed brain surgery, Bailey's parents came to Cleveland Clinic Children's, where unique technology called SEEG made the difference. SEG, or stereoelectroencephalography, it's a procedure that uh, is aimed to study the brain, deep areas in the brain. Then we make little tiny pinholes in the skull, and then we place those little probes in those areas from where we need to study. Once the probes containing tiny electrodes are in place, seizures are monitored for several days. Results help doctors carefully pinpoint which part of the brain is causing the seizures. All of this was coming from an area in the left frontal lobe, which is one of the most prime real estate areas, if you will, of the brain. Several weeks later, Bailey had the part of her brain that was thought to be causing the seizures removed. It was a hard decision, but in the, in the end, Bailey is more active now than she was on the five medications that were not working. This is Bailey now. She's happy, healthy, and most importantly, seizure-free. Next year, if she continues to be seizure-free, there are, will be greater chance that she'll continue to be seizure-free for the rest of her life. I want her to be able to have a family, be married, have kids, get a job, do what she wants to do. Um, those weren't really possibilities with the medications. It's been such a long road, so we're looking forward to just being normal again. At Cleveland Clinic, I'm Erica Foreman. And actually, Bailey's life has been improved thanks to Rosa, your robot. Yes, indeed. So Rosa is the technology that my former company called MedTech created. I founded this company uh, almost uh, over 10 years ago. And we, start, we, we went from a startup company to an IPO mm -hmm. company. And then this company was actually sold last mm -hmm. year to uh, a big uh, US group. And uh, after this uh, sale, I decided to start a new venture. Uh -huh. and, and now, actually, this entrepreneurial adventure is uh, titled Quantum Surgical. And you're targeting liver cancer this time. So what can we expect in this field? Yes, indeed. Uh, first of all, liver cancer is one of the fastest growing, unfortunately, one of the fastest growing cancer in the world, especially in Asia. And we are developing a new generation of robotic platform uh, to help minimal invasive treatment of, uh, of uh, liver cancer. Okay. Um, now, uh, we were talking about the provisions and the disruptions we might uh, see upcoming in the near future, but you know that the debate has been so much eating up about the fact that the evolution of robotics is disrupting so many of the industries, and I mean, there's a lot of consulting firms that predict that 30% of the job as we know them will disappear by uh, 2030, which is just upcoming because of robots and AI. So. We're not going to deep dive into phantasmagory or something, but do you see this revolution, or so-called revolution, disrupting the health field and sector? How do you see it upcoming? Um, you know, innovative technologies in the field of healthcare and surgery, and uh, specifically robotics, 
those technologies are going to play a major role in the coming years in facing, uh, you know, the, the, the new challenge, mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the, 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 the new challenge of surgery. So th those ch challenges come from the fact that, generally speaking, we are in a situation where, uh, you know, the general population is uh, getting older, you know, we have an aging of the population. This means more and more patients to be treated. And those patients are basically asking for uh, you know, a very high level of standard in terms of treatment. There is a growing demand for high quality care. Mm -hmm. And in order to face this need, we have a shortage of uh, healthcare professionals, generally speaking, and, and surgeons in particular. So less professionals to uh, treat more patients we, who are more demanding for high, for top quality care. Mm -hmm. And at last but not least, uh, there is a very, you know, strong, um, you know, wave of so-called minimal invasive surgery. That means that we are trying to uh, carry out uh, operation surgeries through very small incisions. So uh, technologies mm -hmm. and robotics is the solution for all those uh, difficulties that we are facing. But actually, you were mentioning that the fact that patients are pushing a lot for those kind of super techy solutions when it comes to their own uh, health. Um, do you think or do you see them benchmarking a lot um, the uh, clinics or hospital they can go to just because of the technology solution they actually can provide them with? I mean, how do we face now patients that are definitely uh, behaving themselves as typical users when it comes to technology? Yes, indeed. We are facing a very interesting situation right now. Uh, actually, patients are, you know, the, the biggest demand for technology actually comes from patients, you know. Uh, I think that, um, uh, you know, the relationship uh, between the patients and the healthcare world has completely changed over the past decade. Because patients are fully connected, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to internet, uh, thanks to uh, new means of communication, uh, patients are fully aware of, you know, the latest techniques, the latest trends, uh, available, and they are obviously demanding to be able to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to, to benefit from those uh, new uh, trends. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is um, uh, a growing pressure on the healthcare professionals and hospitals to basically be able to uh, make available those latest technologies, those la latest trends for the patient. Again, they can decide to make them available, but. It, this has a cost. We're definitely targeting investing in, in this digital future, but when it comes to surgical robotics, the costs are just tremendous. So how do you help them to try to um, um, actually take this new, um, this new uh, trend and finance it? Because okay. if, if you can just remind us the, about the cost of one Rosa for one, uh, one clinic. So it is a few hundred thousand uh, euros. Uh, when it comes to Rosa, you're talking about uh, 400,000 euros for mm -hmm. one unit, but you know, it can be even more expensive. You know, some robots are up to 1.5 million euros. Uh, first of all, I think it is very important to uh, recall that those technologies uh, are made to make procedures safer and more reliable. Mm -hmm. So because procedures, because surgeries are safer and more reliable, they are actually uh, money savings to be made at a very high level from uh, the healthcare systems. So uh, there is obviously a completely new economic model to be uh, created, to be uh, set up in order to make those uh, new technologies available to the vast, just, uh, the fast, the, you know, the, the, the vast majority mm -hmm. of, uh, of patients. And maybe one of these new business models would be one of those we mentioned a little earlier with Charles when it comes to the IoT. Uh, we're seeing more and more in assurance companies teaming up with the IoT companies so that they can actually monitor better their um, um, customers' um, behavior and data. And then Taylor made some new offers so that they can, again, just see um, how they can reduce cost uh, at the end of the day. Do you see do thing, do those kind of teams, like again, in insurance companies, um, uh, upcoming uh, in the health sector, like the real sector you're dealing with, robotics and surgicals? 
Yes, indeed. First of all, it is important to recall that you know, um, healthcare professionals have an obligation of means, not an obligation of results. Mm -hmm. So this means that there is a great interest from insurance company to see that kind of technologies to be widely used by healthcare pro professionals. First of all, because they are capable of bringing uh, you know, the traceability, uh, which means that we can better assess and understand how a procedure has been carried out from A to Z. And second of all, one can imagine that in, a, in the near future, uh, insurance companies will go to healthcare professionals and tell them, okay, if you are capable of doing this procedure with this assistant, with this technological assistance, then you, uh, you know, your policy, your insurance policy will be lower. If you are going to do this same procedure hand-free, without any assistance, then you know, you're know you going to have to pay for a higher insurance policy because obviously the risk is higher. But isn't it um, a way for insurance companies to take over the part of failing um, health systems, like when governments, when institutions can actually uh, afford uh, this kind of innovation when it comes to, uh, to technology and to health, insurance companies are taking over? Yeah, I think again, it all belongs to this new economic model I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that um, within this new economic model, obviously uh, insurance companies have a, a big role, a major role to play. And how are they going to play you know, this role? Uh, very hard to say, but we can see that you know, um, there is a tendency from insurance company to try to monitor and uh, control everything from A to Z, mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe you know, uh, you know, the, the availability of such technologies is going to you know, uh, make you know, this tendency even, even, even faster. Which brings us back to the question of data and data ownership. Uh, where do you see this very debate heading? Again, we're dealing with very sensitive uh, set of data here. It's health and personal data. Yeah, so I think obviously you know, authorities have a very major role to play uh, for this very specific topic. Right now, when it comes to uh, healthcare, most of the or most of uh, countries already have some very strict rules when it comes to managing, you know, the patient data. Uh, it is not possible, for example, to uh, you know, there are some very strict uh, rules uh, to be followed when it comes to managing patient data. But again, I think that uh, there is no every system uh, can fail, mm -hmm. and so I think that uh, this is the role of authorities to make sure that we have a very uh, you know safe. Uh, system for the benefit of patients. Let's stay for the conclusive question on the on the level of ethics in relation, if you may. Um, of course, there is another buzzword when it comes to, to ELs, which is augmented human. How far do you think we can enhance life and the human body and the human brain? Because that the new frontier here. So this is this is indeed a, a, a very a very uh, big tendency right now. There's a lot of talks, discussion, controversy going on or around augmented human. Uh, I think it will take uh, maybe uh, half a day to discuss uh, the whole topic, but what I can we say... We have five <laughs> minutes, but if you want to take half a day. Uh, so, so I think what, what I can say is that, um, first of all, uh -huh. it is uh, interesting to see that uh, some of the major innovative companies, such as Google, uh -huh. are entering this field. Um, because um, uh, and another thing that I think is very inter interesting to mention is, you know, I think everybody has heard of, of a company called Karmat and the mm -hmm. artificial heart that they created. Uh, maybe uh, you know, a few decades ago, if one has even imagined that uh, a patient could live with an artificial heart, uh, one have been, would have been that these people is, it was, ma was mad. So what it means that this is we are at the very root of innovation. Innovation is being able to think out of the box on rethink what we believe as being reasonable or not being reasonable. So it is not uh, a big surprise to see that one of the, some of the most innovative companies are going you know, to, uh, to, to meet this challenge of uh, augmented human. Thinking of the box with Bertrand Naum, it's a great honor again to have you on stage this morning at DG World Summit 2017. Thank you so much, Bertrand. Big round of applause for Bertrand Naum, please. Thank you. Merci.